but I'm in the middle of the dark on top of this, you know, this thing in the cemetery and I'm calling those spirits and I'm hearing all type of voices. I'm hearing voices, I'm hearing animals, I'm, I'm hearing trouble sounds and those things are coming into me. If you were raised in a family of witches, how could God get your attention? What's up everybody? Thank you for joining us again at LED Live. We got a really exciting testimony today, but first I just want to thank all our Patreon donors, all the people that support this ministry. We truly cannot do this without you guys. There's a lot of ways you can support us. You can go to Patreon, you can go to our website for a one-time donation, or you can buy some really cool t-shirts that they sell over at lightwear.shop and they're really good conversation starters about you know, sharing your witness. We call it wearing your witness. But we want to get into the story because I have my friend Fermi here who was raised in Haiti and her family was a family of witches. They were into witchcraft, is that right? Yes, yes. My family, I was born in, in Haiti, yes. And uh, my grandfather, uh, Mike, um, was a chief of, of witches. Um, and it's very common over there. Um, you know, if he had the authority because he was a chief um, in, in that region. And of course he practiced a lot of witchcraft. And so because of that, um, you know, I came right into the world through the, you know, through that family foundation. And, um, and of course darkness, you know, um, was the thing that we lived not knowing that it was uh, so much of darkness because it was a common way of, of life. You know, until I came uh, into a relationship with uh, Jesus Christ, I started to understand the difference between light and darkness. Then I understand that I was living a life of darkness. So you were born in Haiti. You were born into this uh, culture that accepts witchcraft as kind of normal. Here, we're kind of, you know, a Christian nation, quote unquote Christian. But over there, is there any talk of God or Jesus or is it just all darkness or how exactly is the culture there? The, well, it is a Catholic um, okay. nation, but it's not really embraced from a religious perspective. It is, but uh, maybe, maybe a 1%. Hmm, okay. You know, very, very small percentage of people who actually embrace it for what it is. So is it kind of like just good luck, charms and stuff or something? Uh, correct, uh, yeah. correct. So we'll go to church, but it's not really practiced. You know, I'm a church goer. Some people do not really um, get involved in a witchcraft, but they don't really have the foundation, the religious foundation either. Yeah. So they really have no foundation. And so they can easily be pulled into the place of, you know, of witchcraft yeah. because they don't have anything from the religious, you know, perspective to sustain them. Yeah. And we know that the ultimate place to find safety is in God. Amen. And he's given us instructions um, in the Bible. We have the instructions yeah. um, on how to live safely, not by putting statutes, not by putting things around our homes. He alone is enough to Amen. protect us. Now, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 12, go and break those altars, mm, yes. specifically. He says, go and break those altars. Who is he telling to go and break those altars? Those who have the knowledge, yeah. like me and you, yeah. right, Mike? Yep. Yeah. And that's what we want to do here is we want to expose darkness. We want to bring the information to people so that they can now have the knowledge, now the <clears throat> The ball's kind of in their court at yeah. that point because the Bible does talk about in the New Testament, it says that God winks at our sins committed in ignorance, but now commands all men to repent. Once you have the knowledge, mm -hmm. it's, it's up to you. You have to make a decision exactly. and you can't choose to live in ignorance. Like, no, if I just, if I don't know, then I can just, no, it's our duty to seek truth like it's gold. I want to know, okay, I, I really, I'm curious about your story. So you were raised in Haiti. What's, what's your childhood like? I want to know, I want to hear the whole story from where you were raised, what kind of things you experienced and how God got your attention to where you're at now. Okay, well, to tell you my whole story, Mike, um, uh, you'd have to read my book. <laughs> okay. Okay, it has yet to be published, awesome. uh, but it will be pu published uh, soon. Um, and that book will be The Power of Agreement, how to agree with God and, you know, be in that place of light and safety. But um, just to give you a little, um, just a little bit about my testimonies. Yes, I was born um, in Haiti. Um, I came here to the United States um, 
46 years ago. How old were you? I was 14. Here? Okay. Um, I'm now 60 years old, thank God. Is it a big culture shock? I don't know anything about Haiti. Is it like third when world I came, or city? Thir or? Yeah, thir third world. Okay, like yeah. what kind of like houses are like? Dirt it, floors and stuff. Or? Haiti is known to be the one country in the world that has um, uh, the worst level of development, wow. no development, and no infrastructure. Wow. So we pretty much have, we're so outdated in everything, backdated, mm. that um, so I know that it is um, um, expert have studied, you know, the story of Haiti. So we are very much one of, I think, the you know, um, the worst in development and all wow. of that. But there's a lot of resources, the potential for it to, um, you know, to be developed and be a resource, mm -hmm. you know, as God would want it to be, it's there. However, um, but, and again, when, when you grow up in a place like that, where there is no structure, where there is education, you know, is so outdated, mm -hmm. uh, you don't even have access so much, you have the Bible, but you need an education system. Yeah. So this keeps people more in darkness, okay? You, you, you don't have, because you're in a survival mode. Wow. Going to church, you're in a survival mode. Going to school, you're in a survival mode. In your neighborhood, you're in a survival mode. So being in a survival mode, can you focus on learning? No. Not much. And so growing up in Haiti, um, num number one uh, reason why I had a shaky um, you know, childhood, kind of like the foundation was shaky is because uh, again, being in a survival mode, my mother left me mm. um, in Haiti at the age of three months old. Wow, so you were raised by my adopted aunt, parents? By, 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 her her, sister? by her sister um, and her husband. And so... Um, so how did your mom flee? Did she leave somewhere? Did you never see her? Or? I did at the age of nine. Wow, at nine okay. years old, uh, that's when I first met her. Um, she, she left the United States. My hometown is miles, uh, miles, a few miles away from the Bahamas. You just cross okay. over an island, which is part of Haiti. Behind that island is the Bahamas. Okay. But on a wooden boat, which is how I got to the Bahamas, I always smuggled, wow. um, on a wooden boat, you can get there in four days. Okay, Whoa. whereas if you were in a speedboat or uh, a cruise ship, you could get there in hours. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so wow. you, that goes to show you, you know, the situation in Haiti. And so I, I, my mom left me at the age of three months old in the care of, um, again, a family. I mean, we okay, we had some means, but very little. And so, um, and so because of that, um, you didn't have access to much, um, you know, education. Yes, I went to an all-girls Catholic school because um, Haiti has been a country that is, um, you know, under missionary influence, missionary, you know, um, donations. Most of the things that we got for education came from missionary. Oh. And so we had an all-girls Catholic school that was from the Catholic Church. And so if you had a few dollars for like my mom who was in the Bahamas sending a few dollars, you could afford to pay you know, whatever you pay to send a child like me wow. to an all girls Catholic school. So that's how I, you know, I ended up in the, um, the Catholic school. But um, life at home uh, to, to keep the family foundation or to keep the family in the place of safety, my grandfather, you know, who was a, a chief of witches, um, he had his family into ceremonies, rituals, mm. se seances, and all of those things. And I'm talking about deep, sacrificial blood, animal mm. killing, drinking of blood. Wow. Deep. Yeah, um, I've seen some of that stuff. Deep, deep type of things. But um, to the family, this is what we needed. You know, he's a chief and uh, he knew what to do to keep his family safe. We're thinking this is safety. We grew up thinking it's safety. We followed, um, not me, I mean, I'm saying we, I'm talking about the family in general. I was too small to even understand. But seeing that at such a young age and your family's accepting of it, you had to just feel like this is normal. It was normal. Yeah. It, it was the most normal thing. Yet I'm in school. I'm in an all girls Catholic school. Wow. Um, you know, so you, you, you know, you have the lies all over you. And so, um, yeah, so as a little child, I remember just to fast forward, uh, you know, with the testimony. I remember when I, when I was of age um, of accountability, I was able to understand 
maybe I was about four, five, six years old. Um, once in a while, I think there was a seasonal time um, that we had to be taken to this witch doctor, not my grandfather, because he passed away before I was even born. Okay. I didn't get, but I was told of all the stories and the traditions continued mm. with my family. And so part of the um, things that we had to do is to go to a witch doctor. And the ceremony was we had to be put, um, me and my little brother, because it was two of us that my mom left in Haiti. Um, he's about a year and a half younger than me. The two of us would be taken to a witch doctor um, somewhere by a cemetery he used to live in a little mud house wow. and there there was a well there is a well in the middle of that little mud house in the ceremony the drum beating and all of that type of you know uh, uh, witch music um, and then they would uh, put us inside that well um, there's How something deep is a well like, huh? like there's water down deep, there like deep well, deep yeah. deep water could be as high as you know um, your uh, uh, chest or up to your neck, wow. and they would cover the well. Would That's cover. Gotta be terrifying for a kid. You were a young child. But we were not terrified. Hmm. That's the thing, wow. because we grew up in it. it we, so we, we, it's made to us. It's presented as a normal thing. Yeah. It's a mind control type of thing. Wow. It's you totally under that influence as if it's normal. Okay, and so we would be put in that, and this was in, you know, uh, uh, something that was done often. And every time we went, the ceremony would take place, and then we come out. It's, and I'm sure in their mind, you know, family members, the grown-ups, you know, that did that, and we coming out, we're, we're fine. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, you can't speak back to your parents, even if you saw anything wrong about it, you couldn't say right. anything, but. To us, it was normal because we found that this was a normal way and we would go. Um, you go to school, something happened to uh, a, a schoolmate and you go tell your parent, what well, are we gonna go after that child? Hmm. Voodoo would be done after that child. Wow. And you thinking, you know, you, you can't go to the police, you cannot go, so voodoo is the way yeah. to deal with that situation, wow. you know? Um, and, but you would never hear, you know, the good thing that they think that they're doing with that voodoo is, well, maybe we'll go feed the poor. Right. If we go feed the poor and we do that ceremony and feed the poor, but it was still witchcraft, mm. you know? And so growing, growing up with that, um, you know, it was just, like I said, a normal way of life. But you start understanding that, you know, um, once you come to maybe an environment where things were different, different where people would probably be speaking a little bit deeper hmm. of God or things that don't sound like what we're hearing at home. And you start processing, you're thinking, you know, there's something different, but you don't even know how to access what they're saying. Where would you hear stuff like that? Um, they would be um, right in front of my grandmother she had a little small tiny little mud house you know also but they kind of upgraded and put some cement or, around it but it was a tiny little house next to it was my mother my mother's house which was a little bit more you know uh, better uh, structure right across from my mother facing us is a church wow a seven day adventist church wow right right across from us. I remember as a little child, we would see people going to that church. Again, they have church, mm -hmm. but we, we don't know. I, you know, I have some things that are bla totally blacked out of my mind. Yeah. Even now, I cannot even remember back from those, um, uh, those days. But I, I think um, probably we would go to in front of that church, listening to those, you know, to the songs and people Just talk. Just because it looked like, hey, there's something going on. Wanna... There's something going on. So we knew that church is going on across, and then in the evening, we have that voodoo ceremony that's going to start at midnight until 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and you probably thought this, uh, the world's just kind of blended together, probably, right? Yeah, that, that's all it was. And also uh, growing up as a child in a third world environment with very little resources, um, you were every day more, uh, th the thoughts were, we got to have food to eat today. Mm. Um, or when are, are we going to hear from someone who is abroad that can send some money?
you know, or survival when survival mode, like you were saying, yeah. exactly, exactly. So it's a survival mode. So to think about the deeper things of life that impacts the spirit, there was no, you know, you you had there was no focus on that. Wow, it's amazing because you're saying like you're so distracted with trying to just make ends meet, just mm -hmm. feed yourself over here. We're like a spoiled nation, but we're we're the other way. It's like we're partying, like we're too distracted. Mm -hmm. That was my my story. Was I was just every day it was work and then party, work, party. I was like, when did I have time to think about God or anything? Mm -hmm. And it was just mm -hmm. one particular day that all my friends were out of town or had something else to do that I was home by myself and that's mm -hmm. when God spoke to me mm -hmm. in that one moment. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, Mike, exactly. God has a way of uh, pointing himself to you and he does it in ways that are not common to us. Yeah. He does it to the least expected people. The least expected, it could be an item, you know, that, you know, he's, you see something and all of a sudden something is in your heart. Yeah. He has a way of doing that. And uh, it's about his timing also. Amen. It's about his timing Amen. because he could have, you know, rescued me from all of that. I mean, I'm going, jumping ahead a little bit. He could have rescued me from that world of darkness, mm -hmm. but he didn't do it until I was 37 years old. Yeah. So he allowed me to go deeper, deeper, deeper into the darkness so that when I did have an encounter with him, mm. you know, then I'd be totally sold out yeah. as I am today, Amen. as I am today. But you know, I have to say also, Mike, and I, I would, I, I pray that the world will hear this um, because during those, my teenage years, I was raped. Mm. Um, well, all of that voodoo ceremony, why didn't protect me from ra being raped? Right. Why did it not protect me? Um, as a teenager, um, 15, 16 years old, um, not, not only that I was raped by family member, 15, 16 in high school, at that time I'm already now in the United States, I'm gang raped. Wow. I am gang raped, you know. Um, you this know, was in, in, the, in United, the United States. All of that comes from um, the nature that you carry. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that you'd understand that once we come into a relationship with Jesus, we inherit his nature. Amen. And so because we inherit his nature, we, are, we do have a protection because he protects us. Yeah. If we don't have the nature of Jesus Christ, we have the nature of the opposite, which is Satan. Yeah. And Satan will cause things to happen to you. So all of that witchcraft gives me a nature that attracts things mm. and it attracts the rape, rejection, abandonment, you yeah. know, lack of self-esteem, yeah, depression. every depression, mm -hmm. all of that. And so, so there were so many things that I suffered, you know, coming from that place of witchcraft. Uh, witchcraft is witchcraft. Yeah. It, 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 it develops you into things that build you up, into more of it. You get deeper and deeper into darkness. And the end of it is death. Yeah. The end of it is death. And so, so as a teenager going through that, I was a lost person, not knowing that I'm lost. Yeah. I just know that my life was not normal. I just know that the place where I was, it was not good, but that's all I had. I had an environment that I could not change yeah. because I depended, I depended on family member who they had, they had, uh, they knew about God but they, they did not know who he was. Right. They knew there was a God. They, they, so they, couldn't, they could not have taught me about God. And so it was, okay, it is what it is. Again, even leaving Haiti, coming across to a place that is better developed, right. coming to the United States, um, you st I still had no knowledge of who God is. I'm still lost. Um, so now I have the freedom to do even more dark things because I'm in mm. a place where freedom yeah. is given to do more. Because where I was in that in 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 Haiti, um, you know, parents are very strict. Not only that, you you under the influence of witchcraft, but there's a level of strict, um, you know, ness in our homes that you know we get away with things here that right. you do not get away over there. So it's it gets even tougher. You know, um, you don't have the right to ask questions about things. You don't have the right to, in coming here, now you're starting to learn about freedom. Yeah, you'd be a little rebellious and uh, stuff. Rebellious, but mm -hmm. you're still in a home that is by culture, 
You see that? Mm. So it makes it tough um, on someone like myself or anyone else who lives, you know, comes from a culture like that. It makes it really tough. And so life uh, was hard. And I believe destiny was playing a great part in my life. Mm. Destiny was playing a part in my life where um, I was not dead on purpose because mm. I could have died. Yeah, God I, was protecting you. I watch people in my, I, I watch peers, people in my circle, you know, who lost their lives, yeah. you know, due to that background and all of that. But again, destiny, you know, had a purpose in my life. And so um, um, I searched and I, I searched for answers. I asked and, um, and I even started to frequent the Catholic church. You know, since I remember being in an all-girls Catholic church in Haiti, um, I would go to Catholic church, but it was just the way that maybe this is the only place yeah. where I could be a better person, but there was no knowledge that I needed, mm -hmm. you know, to come out of that place of darkness. And so um, there was no strength, there was no um, balance, no boundaries, just living. Yeah. You know, so that darkness comes from when I was born and it just engulfed me in everything. Um, so, you know, my social life was at a minimum doing the best that I can, of course, you know, and you have the potential, you know, to live, um, you, you know, you, life will take you through steps, you know, where you get the basic things that you need, but there's still no influence, mm. no godly influence no spiritual, you know, no, no godly influence on my life. Yeah. And so I remained, um, you know, a very lost person, you know, and it's not a place where anybody wants to be. Um, you are in darkness, but you don't know how do I, to identify the darkness. Right, you kind of reach a place where you're like, uh, you feel like hopeless and you just kind of escape through, for me anyway, I, I knew Nothing I'm doing is bringing me hope or peace, but I, I have to live. I was born, so I'm just going to escape through drugs and alcohol and mm -hmm. sex and music and just all these different forms of escape. Mm -hmm. But you're still always plagued with, like, there's got to be more than this. There's got to. It's funny you say this, that you, you're thinking there's got to be more than this. And I did not develop, you know, that thought um, until years later mm. that I'm better than this. Something inside of me is telling me, you're better than this, wow. you know? But you said the word hope. Um, you don't, that word never even crossed your mind, mm. you know? Right. That, because if you can think hope and you understand the definition of hope, yeah. that means there's a better day ahead. When you are in darkness, that word never crossed your mind. Right. It has no meaning. You know, yeah. it's almost like it does not even exist in the dictionary, yeah. you know, because you never hear of it. And so it's just every day um, you and, and it's like um, I got to walk over everybody else to try to, you know, I got to I, I have to I have to step over everything I can step over. I got to do it. I got to push through everything I have to push through takes a lot of strength and courage that you don't even have. Yeah. So you in a world where nothing's to make nothing seems to make any sense at all except you get up every day well what else and, and you start getting used to the to, to the things that you're going through yeah. you know you start going getting used to them you know uh, rejection okay well I know if I go through this if I go to this place it seems to be where I need to be today well if they reject me it's okay because that's all I know you know, or maybe somebody's going to abandon me again. For example, living in that world of darkness, um, you know, having that nature, you know, um, you know, attracting everything that can destroy your life. You expect that, okay, well, someone else is going to rape me. What else is new? Mm. You know, you have a boyfriend and you think that, okay, well, all I have to do is have sex with him and it's, it's going to be okay. And you walk away. Yeah. You make that person happy and you okay and say, okay, well, another one. Yeah. So your life become a part, uh, like a, 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 a doormat yeah. for everybody to walk on. Wow. You know, the, the, your life become a, a doormat. But my, the, the, that place, again, with the destiny, you know, taking you through the process, your destiny, which you don't know, uh, is taking you to the process. 
somehow from time to time you will find yourself in a place it seems like there is something that happens in your life that says I think there's better mm -hmm. I think something better and you want to find that thing that is connected make it a little bit better mm -hmm. I used to find that um, in school when I was in high school um, mysteriously um, I had friends of course when you feel that you rejected by everyone no one accepts you and you find one person who actually you know have a genuine conversation with you yeah. and you're like wow I want to hold on to that friendship yeah. I want to tie myself to that friendship and so there was a friend a young girl in high school um, she had a Christian parent this is a public school public school mm. um, she she had a Christian, um, she had Christian parents. Both her mother and father uh, were Christians. And um, she would invite me to her house sometimes. Mm. I'm thinking, wow, wow, somebody's inviting me to their That's house? Awesome. You know, and so I would go, when I go to that house, I would sit at a table <laughs> with the mother and the father and her and her little sister and they would take me in like I'm their own little child. Oh. Their own, and they would have, you know, dinner with me at a table. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, this is good. I want more of this. Yeah. I want more of this. I'm probably at the dinner table. They probably saw the need, yeah. you know, to, to, to bring me to that environment. I didn't know that, but I think they probably, if they were Christians, I am sure, oh, yeah. you know, that God showed them that they needed to take me in. So often she would bring me to her house. Mm. And, and so I remember those moments and I cherished that friendship. But what it does to you before you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you now become codependent yeah. on that friendship. So that's another level of problem. Because you're sensing the peace that they have, but you don't know where it's coming from except that person. Exactly. And so you become, so you tie yourself to that, which is not really, there's no balance, there's no mm -hmm. boundaries. So now you want that. And, um, and so you hold on to that relationship. You want more of it. It's, a, it's the process of searching, yeah. searching for the light, searching for truth, all of that. Again, it's a step-by-step -step process. And um, your environment, your home environment, your social environment, you know, it all depends on that. You know, how fast will you find that place, mm -hmm. you know, of light? How fast will you find, you know, that place where you need to be to have the life that you were born for? And so, um, yeah, so it was a tough life. There's a whole lot of other experiences that I've had because of the witchcraft you know, in my life, a um, lot of other experiences, um, everything that could take someone to the path of destruction. I think that um, the work of darkness, they worked it all, it worked it itself through me. Yeah. Throughout the whole process, it did. Got involved with the wrong crowd of people, got into intimate relationship with the wrong crowd. It was one thing after another. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it was a tough place to be. And so, again, as we know, light in darkness. Darkness is darkness. It takes you down the path of destruction. At the end of it is death, you know, and you keep sinning. Yeah. You, you're living in sin and don't even know that you're living in sin, yeah. you know? And so um, sin, the end of sin, you know, a life of sin is death. Um, so you, you find, I find that um, uh, when I came to having a relationship with Jesus Christ, I began to understand that he is light. And the word of God says he came into his own, in his own did not receive him. Yeah. Um, he came into darkness, you know, he came into darkness, darkness disappeared. Mm. When I came to that knowledge and I came to understand, I have been living in darkness. That's why everything of darkness have been impacting, influencing my life. And I made a decision, I wanna live in the light. Wow. I want the light to impact my life. And of course, everything of darkness start chasing after me. Oh, yeah. they're, they're coming even more fierce, yeah. even, you know, with harder, um, you know, things into my life. But once I came to that knowledge and realized, um, and realized there is a better place to be, and that is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I made a commitment. Yeah. I made a commitment, this is the life that I want to live. Not only that I want to live the light, the, the, the life, you know, in the light, I want deep knowledge. 
because what I knew was of darkness. So if I was getting knowledge of darkness, now I need to know about light. Right. I need to study about truth light. truth will make you free. Yes. How did you, okay, so you were hanging out with this family a lot. Is that where you started hearing about the truth? Um, I don't, I don't remember if that's where I started hearing about it. I think the very first time I really um, heard about truth, um, well, about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I started hearing about Jesus Christ the very first time. Um, it was, again, uh, I was 30, 36, oh, 37, yeah, 36, 37. I believe that family had, was purposely, um, God put them in my life just so I begin to have an influence, an yeah. impact. Wow. Um, a seed planted. A seed planted. Because I cannot remember, I really cannot even remember the type of conversations we had. I just knew that the environment was inviting yeah. and it was a place where I felt safe. But I cannot remember all of the conversations that wow. we had. So when in your 30s, when you accepted Christ, what were, where were you getting this knowledge from? Where were you uh, getting fed? Like somebody was in your path that was sharing Christ with you, being a witness? or I think... Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was being fed. I think I started to understand better that um, that I had a purpose, and I started to um, understand there was something different, mm. uh, just something different, and it was better. And it started. It started after I had my first two kids okay. I was in a relationship again wrong type of people uh, drug dealings mm. um, very dangerous uh, again you know I, I, I got to a place where the, the environment changed um, the circle of influence influence um, was even more dark um, impacting with um, violence mm. Um, death all around me, people were getting killed um, because of the type of lifestyles that people were living. Um, drug dealing mm -hmm. was very, you know, a big part of that. Um, and I was involved with one. Wow. I was involved with one. Um, I had my first two kids, you know, s s you know, in, in that environment. Um, and so the way to have an identity back then was you get involved. You start doing what they were doing. Yeah. For me, I was not selling the drug, but it was around me. It was what was being brought around me. Yeah. I knew, I had sense enough to know not to get involved in it, but I could not deny, you know, um, I could not deny having the presence of it yeah. because that's all I had, the support and all of that. So I was right in the middle of it. Um, never had the desire to do it, but I was right in the middle of it. Somebody could have shot me any time, yeah. any time, day, but it did not happen. And so, uh, but I started helping the person that I was involved with, with the process. Yeah. I started helping the person because it was a life partner. And, um, and you're in a partnership, in an rela intimate relationship with somebody, um, you're gonna help out to the process. Yeah, it was almost and like employment. That was the work that brought the money in and all that. Exactly, exactly. And so because of that, you know, you had a, a lot of people in that social environment that they were living right, they were living well. It mm. seems like, you know, they had it going on. Uh, you know, the social parties and, you know, everything seems to be, you know, well with them. But the Bible warns us. Yeah. I came to find out that the Bible warns us about that. You know, mm -hmm. don't think that they're doing in the book of Proverbs. You find out that just because they appear to be rich, they're mm -hmm. not rich. And so, so I got involved in it by helping through the process. Um, you know, um, I could have been, I, I was in an I was, I came to a time where I could have been arrested. Wow. I was right in an environment where I should have been arrested. 
and somehow I escaped it. Again, destiny. Sounds like God had his hand on you exactly. a long time. Exactly, not knowing. So destiny again had me to escape because that time, I don't know how I did not end up for decades in wow. prison, but I escaped it um, going back to thinking about it. And so in the 80s, in the 80s, I was in 1980, between 1985, 1986, um, I got very, I was living in a depression. I had a deep depression. I have two kids at that time. Um, uh, the oldest one was three, three years old. Um, second one was about a year and a half going into, two, and I was in a deep depression. And physically, I was so skinny, like I was skin and bones, you know, not being able to eat, you know, mentally disturbed. Wow. And, and, um, and of course, that person that I was in the relationship with, um, he got his superpowers by going to witch doctors. Whoa. Talk about, you know. This drug dealer guy. Yeah. Now he's bringing the witchcraft back in. And because stuff. that's how they get, they, that's how they think they protect themselves from being arrested. Yeah. So they go pay a lot of money to witch doctors wow. to do things, to cover them, put things on their bodies, you know, call spirits. Mm. You know, they think that they're walking in the superpower, that they cannot be shot, they cannot be arrested. Yeah. They, you know, they, the drugs cannot be seen. You know, none of that can be done. And so... Um, so as I got into depression, but my depression was about, um, you know, um, uh, you know, adultery, abuse, mm -hmm. all of that was happening around me because, you know, uh, people are uh, living a life of um, uh, polygamy, yeah. you know, uh, they can have, uh, you know, a hundred women and none of us have we can't say nothing, yeah. you know, because wow. we're dominated, we're dominated. So my depression was about, you know, I'm like nothing, you know. I'm Still like, feeling like a doormat. Yes, I'm, I'm like a piece of trash, you know. Um, you have women around me, you know, um, just you, 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 you like you have no life. You have no say so. Whatever happens, you know, it is what it is. Take it or leave it. Leave wow. it. You know, and so that's what um, that relationship was about. So I got depressed. I was living in deep depression, two kids, uh, two kids. And, um, and of course, having friends that were in that same environment, having the same types of boyfriends. Mm -hmm. They were all, we were all in the same. So you had none, we didn't know how to tell any, each other how to get out of it. We were still in that same influence um, environment. And so 85, again, 86, 80, 86 87, um, I was literally dying, you know, mentally, physically. And, um, and that man in my life decided, well, I'll take you to Haiti. Hmm. We'll take you to Haiti. We'll get some help. And um, why Haiti? Because the witch doctors or something? Or? Because witch doctors, um, whoever can help me with that situation yeah. would have been. But I think that I was lied to. Um, even I think that depression that I had um, made a way for him to take me to Haiti again uh, to use me because there's a thing about if you're a very smart person and they see you smart, they feel that you are like their good luck person. Mm, okay. And to use you as a good luck person, they'll take you to a witch doctor and kind of take control of your spirit wow. so that they can use that luck for themselves. Wow. Okay, so I think I was lied to mm. when I was told that we're gonna take you so you can see a witch doctor to help you get better, you know, to, to be healed. And so, but I think it was more so, we're just gonna sell your soul. Wow. Because you're my, you my lucky woman, you are my luck, lucky charm. Yeah. Okay, um, and so that I understood because I knew enough about that growing up in the culture, in the environment, I knew enough about that uh, to know that part of that ceremony that went on, it was about that. And so, wow. yeah, went to Haiti. I went uh, with him. When I got there, um, I was taken up to a cemetery. Um, when I got to the cemetery, there was to be a three day ceremony, a uh, three day ceremony uh, to heal my soul. Wow. Um, I mean, that ceremony was intense. 
intense to the point where I had to drink stuff. I had to drink all type of stuff to get me prepared. You know, I didn't know what one day was going to lead, what the first day was going to be. I'm giving no instructions, nothing. Wow. I'm just told to do something and I must do it. You know, I must do it. And so, um, and so for two, three days, I was in this deep ceremony in a cemetery, all set up, you know. Um, did you have any faith in this or did you just? I had no faith in it. Yeah. I didn't understand it, but I could not question anything. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was not one of those young women who had, you know, gut enough to question why is this happening? Mm. You know, I was lost enough. Yeah. You know, what am I going to ask? You know, I was lost enough. I couldn't ask. And so I had no faith in it, never choose to practice it, but I'm taken into it and it was okay. Yeah. You Just know, along for the ride. Exactly. And so. Here I am, um, you know, in that cemetery ceremony is going on on the, you know, on the second day um, I was to be buried and I'm buried alive. Wow. I'm buried alive. Uh, when they took me through, there was a lot of voodoo dancing and, you know, people masks, you know, uh, their faces looking like zombies and everything. I knew that because I used to see those images yeah. like we see with this Halloween stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to see those um, images. And so because of that, um, you know, I knew when, when I saw the coffin, they showed me a coffin, um, a banana tree with my name written on it. That explanation they gave me. Hmm. And the explanation was in order to buy your soul, you know, from whatever spirit that's killing you, we need to bury you with this banana tree. We need to actually bury you and your soul need to stay with that banana tree. Hmm. And, and once we bring you out, you know, now you're going to live. Wow. You will be fine. I believed it. Yeah. Because I know I'm sick. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking that, okay, if I have to go to that, you know, and I know all of the witchcraft that were being done in my life from a little child. So I'm thinking, okay, um, all right, so I'm going to be okay. I was okay wow. to be buried alive. That's you know? terrifying just hearing it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to me. And so the ceremony and those spirits, Mike, for anyone listening, hearing this testimony, hearing this story, they are real. Yeah. They are spirits in that world of darkness, just as we know the spirit of the living God is real, mm -hmm. that he is alive. Those spirits also in the world of darkness, they are real. Mm -hmm. Because when they are called unto you, when they are spoken unto you, when, when you are being introduced to them, it comes over you and you actually are taken over by the spirits. Yeah, I knew it. Wow. Yeah, because I became unconscious. Wow. Because once they do that, I became unconscious, you know. And so the burial, I know that I was buried. Uh, when I came out of that coffin, you know, I guess they brought me back. They do have power, but there's, we, we know there's one power, right? right? There is one power that is above all that power. And of course, God warns us to stay away from those powers. Yeah. And so, um, so when they buried me, and, um, and the next step of the ceremony was to um, bury the coffin with the banana tree hmm. in it. My soul was to be left in the cemetery. Whoa. So that banana tree is still in Haiti somewhere. Wow. With my name written on it in a coffin in that cemetery. Wow. Okay, till today. Um, and because that's their, this is their thing. They're yeah. going to bury you and this is going to go down history with them that they did something to save somebody. Right. Okay. And so, um, so coming out, but I'm totally, um, in a different place, mentally, physically, or spiritually, what you call the spirits at the time. Uh, cause I'm not normal. Yeah. I'm not that person that went down in that coffin. I'm breathing. I know people were around me. I'm conscious about everything, but I know something totally different happened to me. Wow. Uh, but the belief was this is the process. And I'm telling them I'm not feeling well. I'm not feeling it's part of the, well, you have another day. Hmm. You know, we have another part of the ceremony, the third day. Um, um, you know, that third day um, at midnight, hmm. this is when they're going to end the ceremony. Um, 
I was to be taken on top of a tomb in the, in, the, in the countryside of certain countries. And I saw that in Bolivia when we were there. The cemeteries are not like small tombstone and the little flowers. We have like those, what do you call them? Those houses, like mausoleum oh, yeah. type of like, little yeah. houses. Okay. Those are big, you know, in, in Haiti. And so I was to go start, uh, stand on top of one at midnight. And at that time, they're gonna call spirits on me. I was to be filled with those spirits, 12 of them, 12, 12 of the, and each one of them had a name and I was to be far from the, from the everyone. And I could hear the ceremonies. I could, and they're screaming the names and screaming what I was to say to myself, speak to myself. But I'm in the middle of the dark on top of this, you know, this thing in the cemetery and I'm calling those spirits and I'm hearing all type of voices. Oh. I'm hearing voices, I'm hearing animals, I'm, I'm hearing trouble sounds, and those things are coming into me. Mm. I'm hearing them. Um, and I was naked, wow. totally naked. As I came out of my mother's womb, they put me on top of, because now I'm being born into something else, as if I was not even deeper in. It's totally a satanic counterfeit of being totally. born again, you know? Exactly. But you're in a graveyard, I mean. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. It, it is definitely imitating exactly what God says that he would do. Mm -hmm. You have to be born again in the spirit. Mm -hmm. So their way of keeping you deeper into the darkness or their way of keeping you alive, you got to be born into this thing. And well, Satan so, is a, he's a deceiver. He mixes truth with error. Mm -hmm. He can't just come out and tell an outright lie because we catch on. But, you know, he always spoke scripture mm -hmm. to Eve. Did God not say you could eat of every tree? Mm -hmm. You know, he, he spoke scripture to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's, he's taking what God has made and perverting it. You have to die to the old you. They buried exactly. you. They had a die rebirth. To yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, wow, it's, man, it's amazing. Like, mm -hmm. I just want to clarify that because like, you know, the new age and the occult people get sucked in because it mm -hmm. sounds so close to the truth. Mm -hmm. like, in fact, the new age is like, I have books for research on new age mm -hmm. and it's literally scripture. Tons right. of it. Yeah, we're gonna reach Christ consciousness mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and all these things. Um, but that's how that's how it's so deceptive mm -hmm. because it's so close. Mm -hmm. But you know why? Um, it's because the word of God is power. Yeah, the word of God is alive. Amen. And and God says it. His word is powerful. He knows that the sun has power. He knows that the moon has power. Mm -hmm. He knows that. Everything that he created, everything that God created has power. But he warns us that we have our limit. We should not be worshiping those things. Yeah. We should not use those powers. You know, you know, we should not, we should not lean on those things as a way of life. He gives yeah. them power, you know, he, he has power in creation, but not for us to imitate him as gods. Right. Yeah. to control other people's life. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not what it is. A tree was created powerful enough to grow from the ground, yeah. to produce fruit, for us to have food to eat, yeah. for us to have leaves for medicine. It's supposed to serve us. Exactly. Yeah. But you don't go and serve the gods of the trees. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so, so Satan uses, of course, we know he's an imitation. He imitates God. Yeah. And so he takes this thing all the way to the left, you know, trying to get pe and he gets people lost into it. And people look for that power because why they're denying God. So if you deny God, then you're going to accept you know, what Satan says. And so that's, that's, that's the idea behind that world of darkness, mm. you know, that people use. And so, so my going back to, and you know, I can end my testimony with that to speak about, you know, how people come to live a life where, you know, you have no, no strength, you, you really have no strength, no power, because I'm gonna be speaking about a skeleton life mm. as I know it, biblically speaking, you know. And so coming from that cemetery, cemetery on that day, that, uh, that night, um, I knew that I was possessed. Yeah, you're hearing the voices and everything. I'm hearing them, nightmares. Mm -hmm. I was not normal. I was not normal. How I got in that airplane to get to Haiti, to get to that place of that ceremony, those three-day ceremony, getting back on, back on that airplane, I knew that I was not going back home. I was in a worse state. Mm. I was sick physically, 
I, I was having deep depression. Now I'm mentally sick and I don't know how to explain it to anyone. Wow. And the people that I knew, you know, I dare not say anything because this man that was in my life, you know, he had, um, he had very powerful influence around him. Mm. I dared not expose what was going on, but I, um, I knew enough to tell him that I'm not well. I'm even worse than I was. Hmm. Something is totally wrong. Well, he took me to another voodoo priest. Wow. When I got to Miami, he took me to another voodoo priest. And um, that voodoo priest says, I need to spend another three days with her. Wow. And he left me there with that other voodoo, voodoo priest, you know. Um, and uh, that voodoo priest was again to rape me sexually. Wow. Because that's part of the, you know, that was part of his part of the healing. At that point, I was sick enough to say, you know, I don't care if I die right now. You're not going to touch me. Mm -hmm. I was powerful enough to say I might die, but I'm going to die saying you will not touch me. Mm -hmm. I told him that. And so, uh, but the man left me there anyway. He left me with that voodoo priest. Wow. Um, and instead of raping me, sleeping with me, um, he did another part of witchcraft. He boiled a rock. Hmm. He boiled, he says, if he cannot sleep with me, and I think that was an intent to hurt me because I would not let him have sexual, you know, intercourse with me. Um, he boiled a black rock and he inserted it inside of me. Whoa. Wow. And he took it out with his hand. He wrapped it um, in a piece of paper. Before he wrapped it in that piece of paper, he sent me to another cemetery. Wow. This is all in Florida, in Miami, Florida now. Sent me to another cemetery with a piece of paper in my underwear. And he sent some of his people to accompany me that I was to be in front of a cross because they have cross. Mm. They call it Bawon. That's the name of it. So anyone who is into witchcraft know what Bawon is if you say Bawon. So um, at midnight I was to be in front of that cross. No earlier, no, no later, at midnight I had to be by that cross. And I was to stand in front of that cross and I was to, uh, to speak certain things and things were gonna put over me and then I would leave the cemetery. When I leave the cemetery, I would go by the ocean. I have to go by the ocean and renounce whatever it is they did to me. Oh, wow. Yeah, all of that in one night. I had to go by the ocean and renounce um, whatever they did to me. Um, I had to go throw a coconut with a big gold chain in it. Yes, that was put mm -hmm. in my neck because that big gold chain was uh, I, anyway, all so symbolic stuff. All of that, and so um, so I did. When I got to the ocean, I had to calculate so many feet away from the ocean and um, to walk backward. Hmm. I have to walk backward. Walking backward means I'm not facing the spirits. Uh. <laughs> so I'm walking backward, um, you know, going to the ocean and take the gold neck chain out of my neck and put it in the coconut and throw it in the in the ocean, did all of that. And I had to be by him before one o'clock in the morning. All of that had to be done. And when I came oh. back to him, um, you know, he would take the paper, not me. He would take the paper out of my underwear. When he opened that paper, there was some handwriting on it. There yeah. wasn't there before? No. Whoa. It's real. Yeah. It is real. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's real and people are saying, no, it, it, is, it doesn't yeah, take all that. Play with this well, stuff, I man. lived it and it is real. Ouija boards, tarot cards, stay away from all that stuff, man. Stay away. It is real. Uh, they have power, but it's not the power of God. That's right. And it's going to lead you to destruction. Exactly. And so um, in that paper, there was a handwriting, something I've never seen. It's not anything I've never seen. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. um, Apparently, through the process of manifesting in those spirits, the spirits had their way or whatever that was in me. I don't know what it was. And so when I came back is when he took that rock, that black rock, and he wrapped it around that paper. I was to take that rock wrapped up in the paper and keep it next to me wherever I'm going to sleep. Mm. I'm going to sleep. Um, and I so thought 
that something really maybe because seeing that handwriting right. in that paper sure. i'm thinking something is real here right <laughs> same thing is real because that paper had nothing on it and so here i am now if i left that rock somewhere i'm thinking i'm lost i'm thinking something's mm. gonna happen so now to you me. got faith in this in that rock rock yeah okay and so it is around me um forever cannot remember when i got rid of it um mm. But at a certain point, I got rid of that rock because I didn't see anything good happening with it and all of that. But all of that um, take you to a place where the life that, and so much more, Mike, so much more happened to me that again, all of that would be in my book for yeah. someone to read. But this is enough to tell you that, you know, someone's body going through that process from ch a child, you know, from birth um, to, an adult, you know, it's no joke. Yeah. It's no joke. And you are living a life that appears to be normal with people. Or sometimes you get yourself into situations where people know this is not good for her, but she got herself, got herself into that. Right. Now you start getting the blames. Yeah. Now you start getting the pointing of finger. Now you start getting people laughing at you, mm. you know. And so, um, so living that life is um, it leads again to death because yeah. you don't understand it and you don't have anything to lean on. You don't have anyone that you know that can tell you. Somewhere along the way, um, I might have met someone who would speak about prayer, but I don't know if it made any sense. Right. You know, I don't know if it made any sense. I started going to Catholic church just because I knew that I used to go to church. Mm -hmm. That probably did something for me. I went to church, but there was nothing for me to get from there yeah. to help me with what the life that I was going through. Um, and so um, I started to prosper at a certain place. And I believe because the influence of making money, mm -hmm. the drug dealings and everything, um, it's there. So it's an influence. Yeah. So you go back to that place and say, well, if I'm gonna make money, um, I can do this, I can do that. Um, and then there were things that were introduced to me. I was invited, you know, to get involved, um, you know, in, in certain things uh, socially and um, things that would uh, produce money. Mm. It, and it's like maybe those spirits probably yeah. were trying to show themselves strong. You're you know, talking about I like multi-level marketing? Multi-level like yeah. marketing, not only multi-level marketing. I, I believe that I was smart enough also to get involved, you know, because, you know, going to school, I had a high school diploma. Yeah. You know, I was pretty much, I could articulate myself very well places. So some people saw some things in me, you know, that was worth putting me in a work environment, yeah. you know, where I can produce and everything. So I started doing well in the corp in the work environment and stuff. And then I find that, um, you know, I had resources, money resources coming to me, whether it was legal or illegal, mm. things were coming to me, things were just being introduced to me, money opportunities were coming from all different environments. Wow. So I got used to, wow, I can make money, I can do things and I'm needed. Mm. I'm wanted. Yeah. So you start doing these things, you know, and uh, to the point where, uh, while I'm still dealing with all those spiritual influence, um, you know, I had opportunities to meet people, you know, who were wealthy and they saw my skills, that I was intelligent enough, you know, to introduce me to certain platforms, um, you know, to help me. And I saw opportunities that were right open before me and I started taking them. Um, and I became a business person. I developed in a professional world, still mm. under the influence, yeah. you know, of all those spirits, still under the influence. Um, I became my own business owner. I owned um, an insur insurance agency. I was the very first Haitian woman you mm. know, um, who developed my own insurance, you know, business and was very well known. Wow. That gave me an identity. That gave me something, you know, in my community. Um, but I didn't know how to manage all of that. Still, I have no balance. Yeah. I, don't have, uh, I don't have a foundation. I, I knew it all because at that point, I knew enough to know that everybody else around me, I knew better 
because I'm a business owner. Mm -hmm. I'm, thri I'm uh, you know, I'm striving, you know, I'm thriving. I'm doing things where I'm making a lot of money. I can have whatever I want. I can drive whatever car I wanted to drive. I can get my children the best. I can mm -hmm. support families now. I became somebody. Wow. I became somebody until the business started to. Yeah. Doors begin to close. That's how a lot of people get sucked into this stuff, you know, into the occult and stuff. They they start doing the ceremonies, the rituals, and it eventually pays off, it seems like, but then there's always a downside. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, again, destiny steps in. Yeah. Um, God steps in, Amen. you know, through destiny and say, my appointed time mm -hmm. has come. You know, the in the story of Abraham, um, you know, he raised Abraham as the father of faith and also through Abraham, yeah. all families of the earth will be blessed. Yeah. Sounds like, you know, familiar to me yeah. um, that I'm going to be blessed and I'm thriving and I'm thriving. I'm getting, you know, and so but he told Abraham, um, even uh, when it came time for him to bless Abraham with Isaac as the son of promise. He's the mm. father of faith. Through him, all families will be blessed. Yeah. So Isaac is going to be born, but he sent an angel to Abraham, right? To tell Abraham, at the appointed time, I will come back. Yeah. Right? He did not just give him that son at that time, at the appointed time. Mm. So the appointed time will come. And the appointed time came when he showed up and told Abraham, you're going to have a son, and it happened. Right. So I think to all of us, God will show up at a time. You'll have that voice, however, by whatever means that he's going to talk to you and say, I'm coming back. Yeah. And you're waiting for him to come back. And so at that time um, that the business was thriving and I'm doing well, I mean, I could have anything, anything that I wanted because I was doing so well financially. Uh, but that money that I was making, uh, the things that I possessed um, was not, that were, they were not blessings of God. No. You know, it was Satan that wanted mm -hmm. to keep me in that place of darkness. And so um, in Psalm chapter 10, some people don't think that Satan can bless you. Oh, yeah. Some people will say no. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Exactly. Amen. So, so he knows how to imitate God again, you know, to bless people. And so um, in Psalm chapter 10, he says that Satan lurks in low. He lurks in dark places, in mm -hmm. hidden places, you know, and he creeps around and he blesses the needy. Mm. Wow. That is in Psalm chapter 10. He blesses the needy. Yes, Satan blessed people. No. That's not the blessings of the Lord. No. That's an imitation of the blessings of it's God. A, it's a bribery. It's a scheme. Exactly. So, yes, I was being blessed. Yes, he wanted to show me who I am because um, Satan knows that when a person is on purpose, God has a plan. So he's going to imitate that to mm -hmm. show you you can do well. He brings wealth. Like you said, yeah. he did that to Jesus. He brings yeah. the wealth and you don't know that. You embrace the wealth, you get involved in it and you're being blessed. But in my, um, in my journey, when I got to that uh, uh, place where I believe it was time for God to say, now that I've shown you enough about you, who you are, what you're able to endure, why you suffered, mm. why you're able to make money, the gifts that I have in you, I didn't understand it then. Um, I think he came at that appointed time yeah. and said, it's time for me to knock all of that out of your life. That knocking was hard. Mm. Ooh, the Bible says, the Bible says that the word of God is like a hammer. Yeah. Oh my God, Mikey. Mm. The word of God is like a hammer. Yeah. He says he comes like fire mm. and like a hammer. What does that mean? God will use his word like fire to burn everything off of you. Mm. He will destroy everything by his word like fire. And he will turn those things into ashes so that they never come back Amen. over you again. He will use his word like a hammer to take you out of that mold of witchcraft. Mm. So he came, he showed up and began to turn everything. I didn't understand it. <laughs> oh no, yeah. didn't understand it. I have an identity. Yeah. I know people. What's wrong with you, God? Mm. I have three different luxury cars in front of my house. I own a house. I have, I'm showing off. Yeah. My neighbor sees me now. You know, what are you doing? So in that business, as the doors begin to close, 
money was not coming anymore. Mm. Every source, every source of money shut down, every door. Uh, and I thought, wow. I said, okay, I'm gonna call for a voodoo priest. Mm. I paid money to get one from Haiti to bring to my business. Wow. Um, had a good friend um, who used to visit with me and, um, and the person said, I can get you one. I know one who's very powerful. And I said, okay, how much does it cost? I had money. I said, how much does it cost? I'm gonna go ahead and uh, you know, I'll, I'll pay to get him and flew him over uh, from Haiti uh, to wow. come to Miami, um, shut my business down one day. I said, let's get this thing done. Let we open those doors. Let's get me back into the flow of money. So this voodoo priest came with my friend and we're in the back of my office and we're doing all of that witchcraft and he had a little aluminum plate and, and he began to put a fire. He's raising up fire and throwing all of these things in it. Something picked me up from the inside and said, tell that man to get out of here. Whoa. I got up, I got up, I kicked that aluminum plate with the fire don't know why the place didn't burn that day. No. I had five cabinets. I was selling insurance. This is back in the days we didn't have internet access where uh. things were, you know, paperless. I have files everywhere. Kicked that, I mean, that plate with the fire and I said, get out. Wow. Leave now. Enough. Kicked both of them out of the, and I got on the floor and I screamed. And I cried. And I cried. And I'm, I cried. I'm like, okay, that's it. This is it. There's nowhere else, to, no, nowhere else to turn. I don't know what else to do. So I kicked that man out, out of the place. And at that point I said, okay, I don't know what else to do. I have no idea you know where to go from here. Um, and I collected myself, collect myself back. And I thought, I gotta do something. I have a cousin um, who lived in New Jersey a um, couple of days later, she came from New Jersey to Miami to visit, and she came to my business, to my office to visit. And I'm telling her what I'm going through. She passed away now. Mm -hmm. uh, she passed away, and um, so she fulfilled, you know, in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she passed away, and, um, and she said, why don't you move to New Jersey? Come to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that'll work. That will work, because I don't know anyone. I don't have to face anyone. I don't have to be put to shame. It's a fresh start. Fresh start. I don't care what it takes, I will, I will move. And I start making, you know, packing my things and making decisions and to go. And I really left in a way where, you know, I fixed nothing. I was in a place where there was no way, there was no way, there was no way to fix anything. Things were so bad that I could not put anything back together. Mm. So I just walked away. You know, I left, I did leave some people into situations that I knew that were beyond me, yeah. but I couldn't explain. Right. I could not explain what was going on. Um, and so I left. I was just trying to find a place to hide. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of people thought when I left Miami, they thought I went to prison. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, because people thought that I, they knew what I was, you know, what I was in, people that I was involved with. And so they thought, you know, I must have gotten myself into some federal situation and all of mm -hmm. that, but they had no idea what was going on. So packed up my things. Um, I took my two oldest, at that point I have three kids. Um, packed up my things to uh, take, took the little one, my, um, my little daughter, she was five years old, and I left the two oldest ones um, with family members. And I thought, let me go ahead and establish myself in a place and um, I'll come back, you know, for my kids. Um, so I went to New Jersey. Um, I started um, an entry level receptionist job at an insurance company, right up my level of experience and skills, you know, just for minimum wage. Um, I went, um, but I didn't have enough to support my life. Not coming from, you know, living financially, you know, the way I was living and having a job where I was getting paid $10 an hour, yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you feed three kids? Uh, you know, how do you feed yourself, put gas in your car and, and stuff like that. And so, um, so I got this entry level job at an insurance company in New Jersey. Um, and I began to get depressed again. The depression started coming back. Um, 
And there was a young lady who worked, who was in a cubicle next to me, um, who would um, introduce me to prayer every day. Wow. Um, but I was getting upset. The last thing I wanted to hear was prayer. Mm. Who are you to think, you know, that you can help me? Yeah. You know, and of course I was very private at the time. I'm not telling anyone. The only person who kind of knew in New Jersey what I was going through was my cousin, yeah. you know, because I was staying with her um, for a while. And so when this person started talking about prayer, you know, I'm rebuking her. I'm like, you know, you know, get away from me. Stop. Mm. And I'm yelling and screaming, you know, because I had voices inside of me, you know, speaking other things to me. And now you're telling me about prayer. What is this thing about prayer? Yeah. And of course, I would hear her conversation with other people. She was Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. OK, so you know how they get deep into uh, prayer and, uh, you know, the deep things of the spirit and very energetic and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I don't need this. <laughs> Yeah. I don't need this, but daily, daily she would talk to me about prayer, daily. And, um, and I'm constantly, you know, rejecting and getting away from her. A year later, Mike, a year later, 1999, I moved to New Jersey, um, May 8, 1998. A year later, uh, sometime around October 1999, um, I knew this was it. I couldn't take it anymore. Mm. Could not take it anymore. And I thought, this is it. I got to end my life. Oh, man. I, I got to end my life. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's no other reason for me to live. I got to end my life. And so um, just as I was preparing myself that day, you know, to take my life and my children's life, um, there was a knock on my door. I was stirring a poison. Wow. I was stirring a poison. I'm going to take poison with my kids, you know, to end my life. And um, guess who came to visit on that day, knocking on the door? That Your, friend. That girl in the cubicle next to you? And her name was Hope. <laughs> Hope, wow. Her name was Hope. She knocked on the door, and when she came, and that's when I came face to face with, you know, my destiny helper, you could call it, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and I just dropped on her chest. Wow. And I screamed for my life. And she held me and she took me to, um, to her place and, you know, just took care of me for that day. Wow. Um, but I went to another place that day. I don't know what happened. I, I couldn't figure out what happened. I couldn't figure out, I could not put the date together. All I know is that I don't know what's gonna happen now, mm. you know? And, but I knew that hope on that day, you know, was my saving grace, if you call it. Mm. And so, um, so I went to her house and she prayed with me and uh, took care of me for that day. Um, most of those things are blocked from my conscious. I don't even remember the whole process because it was an intense situation in my life. Yeah. You know, my life was intensely, you know, uh, influenced by, by that w world of witchcraft and darkness. And so, so that Sunday morning, the next day, um, I felt different. I felt somewhat, you know, a bit relieved. I'm not dead. Yeah. So whatever it is that kept me alive, I thought I'm going to visit that Catholic church. Um, it was the name of it was Sacre Coeur, Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. I went to visit that church. You know, and I said, okay, well, if there is a God who saved my life, I'm going to go mm. um, and um, can I see what happens from there? So I went to church after Catholic church. I'm coming up my steps to my apartment, to that place where I lived. And halfway up the steps, there was a voice um, that said, for the sake of friendship, why don't you visit her church? <laughs> You are alive today because of her. Mm -hmm. So why don't you visit her church? I turned around, turned around and went to her church. Wow. I went to a Pentecostal church, never been to a Pentecostal yeah. church. So I walked to the doors and uh, I'm seeing all of that energy and I said, this is not church. <laughs> this cannot be church. It doesn't make sense. It's not church. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I went to church and of course I'm acting up and the rebellious person that I am, I'm trying, I'm like, I'm looking at the pastor, I'm looking at everybody, mm. thinking all these fools, yeah. you know, and I'm looking at Hope behind me because she was an usher. 
in the church and I'm pointing finger at her because the message that the pastor was preaching that day was directly into my situation. Um, so while we're finding truth today, uh, we're finding a better place of learning, more discipline through the process of God rescuing us. Mm. He takes us to those different places. Amen. It may not be the ultimate place of learning right. to find the truth, the truth that we need, but he'll take us to the process that, that we're going to hear. Yeah. He can, if he can make Stepping a donkey stone. to speak. That's right. Yeah. If he can make a donkey to speak. So at that church, I went and the pastor was speaking directly into my situation. Mm. So I've never heard that before. Never understood what a sermon, mm. you know, how deep a sermon can get. I'm looking at hope. I'm thinking, how dare you mm. tell this man everything about my life? Wow. Oh, yeah, I wanted to choke her that day. I'm thinking, how <laughs> dare you? You know, because at that point, I'm, I'm ready to live now. You know, mm. I'm ready to live. I'm ready to fight everything that's coming against me. Yeah. So not even you're going to tell this pastor, you know, about me. And so, um, and so I told her. Um, and she said, no, she used to call me Mimi. She says, no, Mimi, just sit back. And they had me at the front of the church, mm. right under the pastor's breath. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so she said, just sit down. Listen, it's the Holy Spirit mm. talking to you. I'm like, okay, all right, Holy Spirit, talk to me. I want to hear. But somehow through the, through the rest of that service, I was subdued. Um, you know, I started paying attention wow. and I started manifesting in whatever I was experiencing. I'm sure it was the power of God at that time. Yeah. He's making himself known to me. When I left that church, when I left that church that day, I remember the environment was better. The trees were greener. Mm. People look good. Yeah. I'm like, okay, something happened today. Wow. I need more of that. <laughs> Didn't understand the depth of it, but I need more of that. And so I believe it was the next Sunday after or maybe the second week after the, you know, I was ready to be there in that place to hear that pastor again. Wow. I wanted to hear that pastor again to see if he's still going to be speaking truth, you mm -hmm. know, speak, speak something that I needed to hear. And there I was ready to embrace whatever that was, you know, I was ready to embrace that power. I was ready to say yes. And I understand that it was Jesus Christ Amen. that I faced on that day. And um, so I was first, you know, in front of the pastor when he made the altar call, I was first in front of him. I said, wow. I want that. Amen. I opened my arm. I said, I want that. And Mike, the power of God instantly mm. overtook me. I knew, I knew on that day that I became a new person. Amen. Um, I wanted more. He gave me a hunger on that day. He gave me a thirst on that day. I'm calling everybody that yeah. same day. I started calling everybody that I knew. I started calling all the hypocrites who were in my life yeah. talking about God. I said, did you know about this? Did you know about this? I said, I just learned this. Now I wanted a Bible. Yeah. I need somebody to give me a Bible. Um, Hope got me a Bible. Mm. Um, and so I started reading the Bible. And so from there, I made a commitment that I am going to serve you, God. I am going to serve you because you are real. Amen. From this time forward, take my hand and lead me. There is a place of a still small voice, a quiet place. If you allow him, he will speak to you. If you will hear our testimonies, if you want to live, if you know that you were born, you were destined to live, you can live. You can live. If you feel that you've been weak like those skeletons, you've lost your strength, you have all the money in the world. You have everything that you need, but somewhere you feel so weak and it doesn't seem as if there is no doctor, there is no professional, there is no source, anything in life that can bring you strength. If that is you, I am here to tell you that he is willing and he is able to reach you in that place and he will speak to you 
in his own place because he has created an environment already. Each one of us, every single person has a unique place of meeting with him. And it is my prayer today that you will hear this word and that you will allow him to take you out of that place of doing things in your own way, celebrating, you know, celebrating him instead of celebrating those things in the world. So I encourage you today to seek the light. Seek the light and let that become a part of your life and take it from there. And I pray that you become a person who will pray to God and ask you to maintain that relationship with him so that you can live in light and celebrate the light instead of darkness. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that powerful <laughs> testimony with us. I hope you guys were blessed like it by it the way I was. I mean, it's a really a redemption story to show that we're never too far gone for God. You can be in the depths of witchcraft and God still wants you. He desires you. He's going after you. He loves you and he, he'll try everything he can to get your attention. He's in that still small voice. He comes to bring you life and life more abundantly. And he wants to pull you out of that darkness that leads to death and destruction. I just pray that you guys would share this with any family and friends that need to hear this message. And if you were blessed by it, give it a thumbs up. It really helps get this uh, video out into the algorithm so more people can see it. If this is your first time and you're not a subscriber, please click that subscription so that you can catch videos like this. We have lots of videos about all kinds of tough topics and just uh, we analyze the world through the lens of the Bible and we hear great testimonies. And we're so glad you were with us. And we'll see you guys next time on LED Live. There has been very few movies in the history of the world that have completely changed our world. And in 1999, a movie titled The Matrix hit the world stage. These stories are often told and seen over and over again. Is it simply just to make money? Or is there something more nefarious behind it?